welcome everybody here back to um, the med school. And I wanted to, uh, before I introduce the speakers, just hand the mic off uh, to Eric from Twist, who is uh, graciously sponsoring uh, our meeting tonight. So here you are, Eric. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having Twist, and thank you for um, showing up tonight. I'm really looking forward to all the talks. And so um, just a brief introduction to, to what Twist does. So we are a synthetic biology company. We make um, really great DNA oligos. So if you're in the market for that kind of stuff, if you're doing any protein engineering, which I imagine this team is, um, my team will be around uh, here at, after the show so we can talk about your work. And we also have some flyers up front if you want to just do some reading as well. So um, without further ado, I'll pass it back to Nick. Thanks, Eric. Okay, so I won't belabor this. Um, we have a really cool talk lined up by three awesome speakers, um, Gabriele, Hannes, and Bowen, and uh, they're in um, they're in Regina's group and Tommy's group at MIT, and they're going to show us, um, I think, a lot of really cool things about diffusion. Uh, and diffusion is all the rage these days, um, and they're applying diffusion to. Um, small molecules for the small molecule docking pro problem. And so um, I guess without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic over to, I think, Gabriele, who's going to start off the show. All right, thanks. Thank you very much, Nick. And just, uh, is it up until... We're going to do an hour. So... Okay, perfect. And I guess we can, we can also take questions, you know, during the during the talk and at the end, as, as, as you prefer. We'll, we'll be around also after the talk. All right. Um, so as Nick introduced, uh, we're going to introduce our work on uh, doing molecular docking uh, with the diffusion generative model. Uh, hopefully, I actually also want to introduce you kind of like uh, kind of the motivation on, on the first place to, to use these kind of models, uh, not just, you know, because they are, you know, the, the cool kid on the block, but uh, also, you know, why, why does it make sense and why can we explain Kind of the results that we get, and you know, uh, Bowen then is going to go a bit more into the details of the method. Uh, hopefully, you won't fall asleep, <laughs> and uh, and then Anis is going to show us the the shiny results. Uh, and uh, or, uh, this was what's okay. So uh, I think the audience is mostly people with a lot more biology background than I have. So I want spend a lot of time talking what the uh, molecular docking problem is, but I also want to introduce you some of the, uh, some of the assumption that we make. So the molecular docking problem, what we consider is the problem of uh, finding the structure with which a small molecules binds to a protein. And in particular, in this talk, we're gonna assume that we are given the protein structure, whether this is uh, you know, the true bound structure that we could maybe get with some crystallography, uh, or the, uh, and it's also going to show you some results where if we use something like alpha fold or ESM fold to generate the structure. But so we're going to assume that the protein structure is given and we keep it fixed. But now we want to find where these small molecules binds to the protein, so the conformation with which it binds and where it binds. And in particular, we won't assume to know anything about, for example, where it binds in the sense uh, which pocket it binds. So this is, we're doing what's called the blind uh, docking scenario. So this is useful, for example, if you want to find uh, you know, the binding site for, for a protein or you know, you're unsure of where it binds. And you know, maybe we can get into more discussion later on how you can condition on a given pocket. I mean, why is this important? Because you know, proteins, we all love proteins. Uh, they're amazing. And you know, most drugs are uh, small molecules. And, and so, you know, understanding how a small molecules binds to a protein is important in many, uh, you know, pharmaceutical and not only applications. So the traditional methods for, for docking are based on what we call the search-based paradigm. So these run over uh, millions of uh, thousands of poses and score them with the scoring functions. And the issue with this is that since the search space is so vast, these really still are kind of failing with, to grapple with the size of the search space. And so we can see that, for example, especially when, you know, for example, we don't know the pocket beforehand. And so in these benchmarks, it's typically used 
called PDB bind. Uh, if we look at the top one uh, uh, prediction and we look at the percentage of complex be below two Armstrong, which is typically the threshold that is considered kind of success, we see that all the models uh, you know, achieve whether it is like something open source, or like uh, Smina or Gnina or something commercial like Light, they all achieve below 25%. And you know we we all know kind of the success that deep learning models have had in, in structural biology recently, and so people have tried to actually uh, tackle this problem with uh, uh, deep learning methods. But for now, they, these have kind of like still failed to improve uh, from an accuracy standpoint. So they they tend to be uh, faster, but you know even methods like e freebind that came out uh, previously this year. Uh, although they basically replicate all the you know, uh, ideas in AlphaFold for the docking problem, so both from a method standpoint, the way of training, and so on, and, and loss function, they still didn't manage to really show any, any significant improvement. And so kind of when we start is, you know, why, why is this happening and what can we do about this? So the first thing that, you know, one should, uh, you know, Think about when uh, you know rethinking kind of the approach is first of all what do we actually uh, care about you know what's what's the thing that we're trying to evaluate so and you know something important to notice is that typically for a docking prediction we are only uh, you know it's a good prediction we're only interested in it if it's very accurate so if you know something is you know like an Armstrong or two Armstrong way that's you know a pretty useful uh, prediction you can probably use this to understand you know, what amino acids are interacting and maybe to understand binding affinity. But if something is 15 Armstrong way or 30 Armstrong way, it's typically you know, equally bad in the sense we, it's not something that we're interested in. And so, uh, you know, and this is you know, also present in the standard metrics that are used in the field where you look at the number of predictions below some, some threshold. Uh, now, the problem is that we can't use this, this, this loss as a way of training the method, because this is non-differentiable, and you know, for for deep learning, we need kind of uh, to use gradient descent. However, we can use some uh, ideas that are present in uh, you know, traditional learning theory to kind of have a bit, uh, better understanding of what we are actually doing. And you know, if we take this epsilon to and uh, we take the limit to go to zero, so if we take this epsilon to be very small what you want to predict becomes, you know, you are trying to predict basically the most likely pose in your distribution, what's called the, the mode of your, of your posterior distribution. And, you know, the, the, um, all these previous methods use what's called the regression loss, where you typically are doing a mean square, uh, you have a mean square error, and the mean square estimate, which is kind of like, I guess in, uh, in common terms, it's kind of like the mean of your distribution. Uh, it's similar to your mode of the distribution only when your distribution is unimodal. And as, as I hopefully gonna kind of like give you an intuition, the problem is that with docking, the distributions are typically very much multimodal. And so this regression methods kind of fail. And so, you know, here I'm kind of trying to uh, represent this kind of distribution as as kind of this this uh, this posterior distribution. So what the different poses that my model thinks there are with this with this red distribution? Why is there a distribution? Well, first of all, we have some um, aleatoric uncertainty. So there might be multiple possible binding sites, or even within the binding site, you know, the exact position and conformation might be slightly flexible and. And also, uh, there is epistemic uncertainty. So any model is going to be uncertain, potentially between multiple conformations. And so all this uncertainty builds up to this uh, multimodal posterior. And so if we use the regression methods, we're going to end up basically trying to get an average of all these uh, possible poses. And as I will show you in, in the next slide, you know, this turns out to be something very unphysical. And, you know, it already looks, you know, something that's not very high energy in this, very low energy in this, in this example. But it's if you are in higher and higher distribution, this is even more the case. Um, on the other hand, if you use uh, what's called a generative model, this is going to try to sample from your uh, this posterior distribution, and so then 
you're gonna you're likely gonna sample your and you can choose uh, the modes that you then uh, analyze and think it's it's best. And let me give you a couple of uh, real world examples. So this is, for example, uh, a, a, an example of aleatoric uncertainty. This is a, you know a, a bit maybe of uh, an absurd example, but this is kind of to show you what's uh, the effect of um, regression. So if we you know you can see this complex, these two places where this chrome inhibitor binds. And if you run one of the regression methods, um, equibind, what you obtain is a prediction right in the middle of the complex. And you know, why, why, do you, uh, why do you have this effect? Because the model is probably undecided between, you know, since between the two possible binding sites. And so it's going to predict something in the middle to minimize its expected loss. Uh, and so, but this is, you know, clearly it's not a physical prediction. It's not something that would actually be useful uh, to, uh, to any biologist. On the other hand, with the generative model uh, that we'll present, uh, you actually are able to sample accurately both modes. And you know, this is a case of aleatoric uncertainty. So you know, there are naturally multiple binding sites. But even when we have a single binding site, and this is the example with this complex, where the green one is, is the true uh, crystal structure, um, even when you have a single one, this uh, epistemic uncertainty, so uncertainty in the model is going to cause you a lot of artifacts when you use a regression that you, you don't want. So for example, you can see here, equibind that is predicting half of the molecule in, uh, in clash with the protein. And you know, this is clearly something unphysical, but probably it's because you know, it's probably understood it's got, it's got like maybe 90% that this is the correct binding site and maybe 10% that that's the correct one. And so it's kind of trying to average this out. But you know you obtain like a very uh, un, you know unrealistic prediction. And similarly here, you know tank bind, which is another regression methods, uh, you know got the wrong binding site. But on top of that, you know since it was very uncertain about the conformation, to minimize the mean square error, you're going to try to predict everything closer to the to the middle. That's that's kind of how you 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 minimize your expected your expected loss. But obviously this is, this is not like a proper conformation. And you can see kind of this dot more or less. Here for a question. Uh, hi, this, this is uh, yeah. uh, I'm doing this over Zoom. <laughs> Sorry. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Would, yeah. So I was wondering that uh, the the difference between regression and uh, generative models. Can we instead of doing a regression, uh, we can do a classification, right? Like how uh, Pierre Rosetta or Alpha Fold paper does, right? So you can discretize the. Uh, the translation grid, right? And you can similarly discretize the rotation, and then you can ask that, uh, make it a classification, right? And if the model is confused that, let's suppose whether it should place it left or right, it would give an equal probability, right? And the reason I'm proposing this is because in general, the generative machine learning models are really hard to train, right? So can we get around the problem uh, by using a classification rather than regression? I mean, I, I personally, I would argue that a classification in the like, I think what you're proposing is discretizing. And, you know, as you increase the number of discretization, uh, I guess in, in the limit, what, what you're going to obtain is, is the same. And uh, so, you know, at the end of the day, if you have, uh, if you're kind of discretizing kind of a classification loss, uh, then, you know, in, in the limit, you're going to obtain the same. But also, you know, I would say that, you know, it would probably be very hard for a model to reason about. Um, I mean, first of all, it, it's it's unclear how one would you know uh, parameterize like uh, you know buckets uh, or maybe you know kind of voxels in which you put you know each of them, and then you somehow have to discretize also your uh, your uh, molecule conformation. Uh, so since there are a lot of degrees of freedom, I I would find the uh, the the approach of of classification, which you know in the limit uh, should be the same of generative modeling, to be to be kind of hard. And to be honest, I also I'm not 100% sure. You know, I would agree with uh, the fact of you know generative modeling being very hard to train. I guess you know in kind of in the limit, I think you know as you increase this this classification uh, buckets, I think you're going to have something that is definitely harder to train than a typical generative model because, you know, generative models are kind of built for, for this purpose. So just a quick follow-up. We should definitely take this offline, but 
for classification, actually, Tia Rosetta and uh, Alpha Fold have shown that even though you voxelize the discrete space in the structure prediction problem, you can make prediction less than two angstrom. So well, I would I mean, say that that the approach... I would I would sorry I would argue that Alpha Fold is not doing classification. Alpha Fold is doing cl classification for for its confidence, and you know, confidence is just single value, so you can disc easily discretize that. But for the structure prediction. Uh, AlphaFold doesn't discretize it. So AlphaFold is, is a regression model. Uh, maybe we are talking about different AlphaFold versions, uh, but I can assure that Tier Rosetta definitely use classification. Uh, well, um, I mean, the second AlphaFold has two heads. One of them returns like a histogram, like a distribution. distribution yes, exactly. Um, but it also returns in the structure. So I think maybe the, the guy might be talking about the one this, of the heads that returns like a histogram. Okay. The idea is like for every pair of atoms, okay. you can uh, return a, a, a distribution of distances, which is okay, yeah. yeah. That's my guess what he might be referring to. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Sajay. Yeah, the, 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 the challenge is then how you put it together. But I mean, of course, I think, I think you know, to some extent, you know, classification is, I think, could be considered kind of the limit. Uh, of this, and so you know, I guess you know, arguably, you know, which one works better from a, an empirical standpoint is that another, another question? Thank you. Cool. Um, and you know, to conclude uh, my section, uh, you know, we um, we have you know we uh, we're gonna train this this generative model. But then, you know, like typically, you know, researchers are only interested in you know like one or a few predictions uh of you know where of, of possible poses and so we're going to train uh, a confidence model to actually rank uh, the different complexes that the generative model produces and you know for for the top scoring ones that we're going to return you know, to the user we're also going to give use this uh, as a confidence score you know you're familiar with, with alpha fold it is sort of similar and and with that i'll give the floor to Bowen to explain the, the methods in more detail. Quick question about your last point. So that the confidence scores that come out of the dog are a different model than the prediction? Yes, it's a, it's a model, classification model built on top of the, of the... All right, so as Gabriel has motivated, we develop a diffusion generative model for molecular docking. And as Nick alluded to, diffusion models are very popular these days. Uh, so before getting into the specifics of DiffDoc, I want to uh, present a, a, you know, maybe a little bit of a, a different view on diffusion models that uh, compared to the usual introduction, but I think will make more sense in the context of, of our work. So uh, a diffusion generative model works in three simple steps. So first, you consider the space that your data lives in. So here we have a toy distribution living in R2, and you define some forward diffusion that takes the data distribution into some stationary distribution of the diffusion. So in this case, you can imagine Brownian motion in R2, and in the limit, you get some nice Gaussian, which has destroyed all the information about the initial distribution. Then you define and learn, using a neural network, the so-called score of the evolving data distribution. And uh, we would one way of looking at the score that I think is very helpful for, for our purposes is that the score is a time-evolving vector field on the space that the data lives in. So we have a vector field in R2, and you will notice that it is time evolving as the, uh, as the data distribution approaches the Gaussian. And the crucial step is, of course, the reverse diffusion, where thanks to some math proved in, uh, in, the, in the 80s, we know that if we sample from the stationary distribution and follow the time evolving vector field, we can actually undo the diffusion perfectly and recover the original uh, undiffused distribution, assuming that we have learned this vector field correctly. And this is, uh, of course, what uh, underlies all diffusion generative models, even those that don't explicitly use a score-based formulation. Um, and as we go on, we'll, we'll see how this is um, extended to the space of molecular um, uh, docking poses in, in our work, DiffDoc. So to take that first step, let's consider what a docking pose is. Well, previously, we saw data in a toy space, R2. Well, a ligand pose is also an element of a Euclidean space, right? We have n atoms, and each of those lives in a point in R3. So uh, a ligand pose is just an element R3n. 
And in the previous slide, we defined a diffusion using a Brownian motion in R2. So maybe let's, uh, maybe let's do the same here, right? Brownian motion R3N. Well, what does the forward diffusion look like? Well, it looks like this. So, uh, you know, mathematically, there's nothing wrong with this. I can certainly train a model with the objective of undoing this diffusion, reassembling the ligand in the correct binding pocket, as it were. But you might complain and say, you know, this doesn't look very uh, feasible or, uh, or very physical. And maybe more, um, more precisely speaking, it feels like we, would, by asking a model to reassemble the molecule in the binding pocket, we are asking the model to reason about too many degrees of freedom relative to what we actually care about, right? Because um, the space of docking, valid docking poses, as we know from the way that classical docking programs are, are, are developed, is not necessarily the full three in Euclidean uh, degrees of freedom, but rather something that you know, goes along the following paradigm. So in a classical docking program, the program is not trying to reassemble the molecule in the pocket. Instead, the program is going to receive as input a ligand molecule already embedded in 3D space. And in that process, the structures of the rings, the local, um, the bond angles, the bond lengths, for example, and importantly, the chiralities, they are already instantiated. And the docking program is not going to try to, you know, recover those on its own, but rather it is going to take this small molecule, then look at the protein structure and simply move around the small molecule relative to the uh, protein, maybe changing its torsion angles in order to assign it to the correct docking pose. So in DiffDoc, we also want to leverage a similar kind of inductive bias, right? That, that the chiralities, the bond angles and bond lengths should not be something that we need our generative model to do. So what this suggests is that it, instead of thinking of a ligand pose as an element of three and dimensional Euclidean space, as we saw before, we think of a ligand pose as being described by these four pieces of information. And you, know, you can uh, decompose these in many ways. You can say rigid body motion or it's this torsional flexibility. Um, but the take-home message is that these, this first part, the so-called local structures, these are, are fixed. They are, in effect, fixed in both a physical docking process and in the computational model of docking uh, that is currently used by classical docking programs. And so what we want to do is we also want to do the same thing, right? We want to keep these things fixed and have the generative model fill in the rest of the pieces of information. And because we have a diffusion generative model, what this amounts to is that we need to develop uh, such a diffusion process and a diffusion model over a M plus six dimensional manifold. And this manifold you can think of as being a sub-manifold of our three dimensional Euclidean space. Uh, and it corresponds to the M torsional degrees of freedom and then six degrees of freedom corresponding to rotor translations. So how do we do this? Uh, this is kind of a, you know, uh, not a, you know, at first glance, it doesn't seem to be a nice manifold. The way it's defined is, you know, with respect to functions that compute bond lengths, bond angles, and chirality, and I have the intersection of, you know, uh, three in minus m minus six plus functions. Uh, so, so how do I diffuse over that space? Well, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to map that space to something mathematically nicer, something a little more compact that we do know how to describe a diffusion over. And the right space uh, will turn out to be the product space of R3, SO3, and, and TM, or the n-dimensional hypertors. And the reason, well, hopefully um, uh, th that makes this seem intuitive is that a point on the ligand pose manifold, which is just a ligand pose, is described by these pieces of information, right? The ligand is at a particular point in space. It has some orientation, which kind of roughly corresponds to SO3, and it has M torsion angles. Um, and, and so that describes a M-dimensional hypertorus. Now, um, we, can, we can sort of say that uh, by looking at it this way, we are claiming that the product space is diffeomorphic to the ligand pose manifold. But the reason it's in quotes here is because this is actually, uh, diffeom diffeomorphism is, is a little bit of a stronger condition than we actually need. We don't need to map points from the product space to the ligand pose manifold. And one way that maybe you can see this is to realize that SO3, for example, is a group, and so it has an identity element. Well, what is the identity element of a ligand pose? Well, that's not totally clear, right? Also, we have M torsion angles. And you know, a torsion angle um, on the torus, you know, it has an origin, right? So, so, but if you look at a molecule, what, you know, what conformer of the molecule corresponds to a zero torsion angle? It depends on which torsion angles I pick, right? So there, there's a bit of redundancy in uh, trying to define a diffeomorphism. And so what we actually need is something a little more, more uh, simpler and hopefully more intuitive, is that we need to have a way of mapping displacements on the product space to the ligand pose manifold. 
and maybe just to step back for a moment into the bigger picture, you will find that diffusion models operate uh, always on displacements on spaces, right? So, so when we diffuse, we take a step on the space. And so if we can have a way of mapping steps on the ligand post manifold to steps on the product space, that gives us a way of defining a diffusion on the ligand post manifold using this product space as a proxy, even if we never define a diffeomorphism between the two spaces. And so what we need is a way to map displacements on the product space to a displacement on the ligand post manifold, which is a change of pose. And the way to do this is you know, very, very simple. Uh, you need to have an unambiguous way of taking a ligand molecule, applying some translation, some rotation, and some torsion, and getting a unique molecule uh, conformation relative to the protein structure back. Now, uh, for the translations part, of course, this is very simple. You can always just translate something. There's no ambiguity there. Rotations, we do need to specify that we rotate around the center of mass as opposed to around the origin, for example, because the choice of origin should be arbitrary and it should never enter our model. Similarly, there's a, a, there's a similar issue for torsions because you know, by updating a torsion angle, I could be referring to rotating this side of the molecule or maybe rotating the other side of the molecule. And a priori, um, you know, both of these are valid torsions. So I need to have a way of defining what I mean by a pure torsion so that you know, I can apply this, this function properly. And so what we choose as our definition is uh, we're going to allow for any, um, any kind of application of the torsion. We can rotate either the left side or the right side as long as we follow that up immediately with an RMSD alignment. And this procedure, uh, infinitesimally, it actually corresponds to a pure torsion inducing no linear or angular momentum in the molecule. And you can maybe see sort of a parallel between this definition and this definition, because the definition of a rotation as being around the center of mass is a definition that causes pure rotations to induce no linear momentum. And so torsions is just one additional layer on top of that. A pure torsion is defined as something that induces neither linear nor angular momentum. Do you um, consider symmetry when you do that RMSD computation, the superpositioning and RMSD computation? Like, like for example, these three hydrogens, if you rotated them like 60 degrees, you would uh, just have the same conformer pretty much. Yeah, yeah. So the results, like the, the actual empirical results for ligand RMSD, those are going to be symmetry aware. Um, but the definition of the diffusion process itself does not know that different points on the manifold are chemically identical. The score model, however, um, does not get, to, like the, the score model only sees three hydrogens. It doesn't see hydrogen one, two, and three. So the score model will predict a distribution that um, is uh, also symmetric. So it's just the mathematical definitions. It's not symmetric. Everything else is symmetric. All right, so we've established that we can define a diffusion on the ligand, fold man, uh, ligand post manifold via this product space proxy. So how does diffusion on the product space proxy work? Well, um, thanks to some, um, well, I would usually say very recent work, but uh, it's not terribly recent uh, nowadays. Um, but thanks to this work, we know that uh, diffusion generative modeling works on manifolds with a small conceptual modification. And here is maybe, uh, it'll become a little more clear why I emphasize this vector space view of diffusion models in the beginning. So in normal diffusion models, we learn a, uh, sorry, not vector space, vector field. In normal diffusion models, we learn a vector field on some Euclidean space. Now we have a manifold, so we want to learn a vector field on the manifold. But what is a vector field on the manifold? It is uh, an assignment to every point on the manifold, a point in the tangent space in the manifold, or a tangent vector at that point. And you know, in, in just, uh, just a few, or just half a slide, it'll become very clearly what this concretely means. But I also want to note that we do need to satisfy some technical conditions that allow us to train these diffusion models. We need to be able to sample the heat kernel or the diffusion, right? The, the thing that converges towards the Gaussian in the Euclidean space, we need to be able to sample the equivalent um, uh, evolving distribution on the manifold. We need to compute its score so that we can actually regress against this vector field. And we need to sample from the stationary distribution, which is the distribution that we get to at the very end, because recall that we generate data by sampling from that stationary distribution and evolving everything backwards. So we have to be able to do these three things. And here's a nice chart that you know, checks the boxes on all of those technical conditions. Um, I won't stand here and read a table at you, but uh, I'll just highlight maybe some, uh, some important things. So first of all, um, the spaces, uh, you know, we, we, we have a product of 
a nice Euclidean space and maybe some non-Euclidean spaces. Um, but the tangent space is, is always uh, a vector space, right? So the tangent space of positions is the space of translation vectors. The tangent space of orientations is the space of rotation vectors. Now, if you're familiar with the axis angle parameterization of rotations, what a rotation vector is, is simply the axis scaled by the angle, right? So, th so this is a, a, a way of converting uh, infinitesimal rotations to R3. This is like an angular, angular velocity vector, if you're familiar with rigid body mechanics. And uh, with the hypertorus TM, the tangent space is, again, a, a nice m-dimensional uh, Euclidean vector space. So you know, despite all of the differential geometry involved, at the end of the day, our model only needs to worry about these three things, the tangent spaces, because the output of the model is going to be an element of the tangent space rather than an element of SO3, for example. Uh, the heat kernel and the stationary distribution for all of these spaces are known because you know, these are quite nice and well-studied spaces. And um, the final thing I will note is that uh, the title of the paper in the talk, Steps, Twists, and Turns, um, uh, comes from, you know, I guess, maybe a more informal way of saying that we diffuse over positions, orientations, and torsion angles. All right, so we've you know, checked all the boxes to make sure that we can diffuse over this space. How do we actually learn a vector field on the manifold? Well, so again, uh, I'm just going to point out that we're, what we're trying to learn at the end of the day is these three pieces of information, right? Because the three of these collectively uh, give us a tangent vector on the manifold, a translation vector, a rotation vector, and m torsion updates. And the score model needs to look at a point on the manifold and give us these three things. Well, what is a point on the manifold? Well, we are diffusing over the ligand pose manifold, so a point on the manifold is just the ligand pose. Right, so, so, so the score model is going to be something that looks at a ligand pose relative to a, a protein. Right? So it's going to look at a, a, the structure of a small ligand relative to the structure of a protein, which is not shown here because it would just be too big. Um, but then the model is going to predict a translation vector, sorry, a translation vector, a rotation vector, and m torsion updates, one for each rotatable one. And these can be quite concretely interpreted as instructions for how to update the ligand pose. Right? Uh, a tangent vector in, in the tangent space gives us a direction to move in on the manifold. So that's what we have here. Now, the way that the score model is going to work is, um, uh, well, I, um, we, we use the general class of networks that are uh, these days pretty well known, tensor product convolutional networks. Um, these are SC3 equivariant because we need our tangent, uh, sorry, we need our translation rotation vectors to be SC3 equivariant. And uh, this is just kind of a pictorial diagram of how that works. We run several layers to learn some uh, vector value embeddings of the different atoms. And then we have an aggregation step that gives us two global pieces of information. Right? So we just aggregate uh, all the learned features towards the center of mass and then output a, a set of two vectors. And that gives us our translation and rotation. And then we also do aggregations around each rotatable bond. And this gives us a torsion update. And then we just apply these updates. So with this, we can you know, take a step back and just look at the workflow. So the workflow in the first step is going to be very similar to a classical docking method. You have your small molecule ligand. It already has some structure. Maybe it's from RDKit. Maybe it's from the Cambridge Structural Database. Maybe it's from Omega. And then you're going to sample from the stationary distribution of the diffusion. And that stationary distribution is going to be the positions are normal relative to the center of mass of the protein. The orientations are completely random. And the torsion angles are completely random. And then we will simulate our reverse diffusion following that vector field along the manifold. So we're going to discretize that to about 20 steps. And each step, we predict how we should move the ligand, rotate the ligand, and change the conformation of the ligand by changing its torsion angles. And we do that 20 times. And uh, gradually, hopefully, uh, you will find that all of your sampled ligands coalesce into some uh, consensus binding pocket. Now, here's the animation of this process. Uh, so in this picture, the, uh, the green ligand is the ground truth docking pose, just for reference. And all of the other ones are random samples and their initial orientations and confirmations. And then we do our diffusion. And in this case, they do all uh, uh, congregate into this consensus binding pose. Now, one thing that I do want to emphasize here is that as you look at this, you may say, well, this is vaguely reminiscent of how a classical docking method would work, right? I mean, I have my ligands somewhere, and then I move them around, and then hopefully, uh, you know, it, it goes to the correct binding pose. And here, I would uh, just emphasize the fundamental difference between a reverse diffusion-based generative model and a classical docking method. 
And that is that the classical docking method is not using a time-evolving energy function or a time-evolving vector field, right? It has a fixed scoring function. And as a result, there is no sampling or optimization algorithm that can give you a finite time convergence guarantee to the stationary distribution or the optimum of that scoring function. What we have here is fundamentally different. And this is you know, what underlies all diffusion generative models, which is that we have a time evolving vector field with the property that in, that, in, in, in a finite amount of time, I converge to the learned distribution of the model. Now the learned distribution may not be perfect, but by definition, you do get to that distribution after running a finite number of steps. And pragmatically, you know, one way to look at this is that if I had a scoring function, I would not be able to transit from you know, my initial starting point directly to the binding pocket because I would have to go through the protein. There's tons of steric clash terms that would not allow me to do that. So I would have to first land on the surface of the protein to get some favorable contacts and then move around, wiggle the ligand around, and maybe eventually I wind up here. But there's no way that you know that you can do that for sure. But a reverse diffusion process with a time evolving vector field has a property that at high noise levels, it doesn't care about steric clashes, right? It's, it's trained in a way that at high noise levels, it doesn't see steric clashes. And so you can directly go straight through the protein if that's what's necessary to get to your binding pose. And that's what we see happening in our inference. All right, so last thing about the method. We have a generative model, and every time you run it, it can give you a different pose, right? Hopefully they're all similar, but they are going to be slightly different. And you can do this as many times as you would like. You can have an infinite number of poses. But how do you know which ones you actually want to use for downstream processing, to run MD on or uh, RBFE on, for example? Well, we train a confidence model um, that ranks those samples. And this, uh, Gabriel also alluded to a little bit earlier. Um, but this confidence model is, uh, um, well, as the name suggests, it's going to predict a scalar score for every uh, ligand pulse. And you would usually take the, you know, the, the top M scoring ones, or maybe you apply some kind of pruning and clustering to remove redundancies and take the top M scoring ones. Uh, so that concludes the, 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 the method. Um, yeah, questions? Yeah. Uh, have you ever checked if the score somehow correlates with the or something some more physical related problem? Yeah, so the, 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 the short answer is um, we do expect it to be weakly correlated, but uh, we don't wants to claim that this is a good predictor of binding affinity. Uh, the longer answer is a little more convoluted, and I'll leave that to Gabri at the end. One more question. So does the model already know at time zero that that's where it needs to go? Just to clarify, I mean, one, one way to think about this is that essentially what you did is you learned the binding site, and then you learned a series of gradients to push the molecule to that binding site. I mean, that will be one interpretation of the model. Um, or do you think during this evolving energy function that it eventually says, hey, actually, never mind, I want to go somewhere else during the steps that I'm going through? Yeah, I would say that um, it's not so much that the model at the beginning uh, already knows where the binding site is, but the model at the beginning, it has a idea of where the posterior mean is of uh, its, you know, its internal representation of the distribution of our binding sites. So the reason I pulled up this animation, uh, and if only it would, it would be moving, that would be nice, um, is because you know, at the at the end of the reverse diffusion, all of the all of the vectors point directly towards the origin, even though there's no probability density at the origin, right? So, so at these very high noise levels, like when t is close to 100, what the model is learning is that the posterior mean is right in the middle because there are three densities that are symmetrically positioned, and as uh, the model um, pushes the sample stochastically along one of these paths, it will you know, gain greater and greater confidence into one of those modes. Um, but for, for that reason, I would say, uh, even if there were a single binding pocket, um, I would not say that the model at the very beginning is literally learning where the binding pocket is. It's more of a, a mean of a posterior distribution. Yeah, I, I guess one interesting control could be to train a model that just learns the distribution of distances for every pair of atoms. So you have, you have your ligand, you have your protein, and you learn the distances. Um, and then instead of using a diffusion process, let's say we just do uh, a gradient optimization. Thing. Um, or is that one of the... Yes, you have anticipated um, the, the, the other method, um, which was uh, released somewhat recently in this field, which is tank bind. So what tank bind does, um, it, there is, it's very similar to the procedure you propose with one additional step, which is that they first use a classification type approach to first select the binding pocket. And then inside that binding pocket, 
they learn a distribution over the pairwise distances and then um, run gradient descent on that. And um, our interpretation of the you know, relative drawbacks of that approach is that, um, well, of course, this is something that you can maybe fix with, with better ways of learning the energy function or uh, better ways of learning the pairwise probability distribution. Um, but what they do is uh, they actually uh, directly have a regression-based output of the pairwise distance for, for every pair of atoms. And uh, so, you know, even though you're learning a distribution, the, this distribution is learned still kind of in a regression-based approach. And so if you have a model that is uncertain about the orientation of an atom, uh, sorry, an orientation of a molecule, uh, like should it be pointing this way or should it be pointing that way, the optimum pairwise distances to predict that minimize the mean squared error is still to predict that uh, all the atoms are in the middle. And so that's why this collapse is happening. Now, maybe with some further engineering, you could get a pairwise distance-like approach to work. Um, that is, of course, you know, an open question. We don't claim that this is the only way to have high-quality generative modeling for molecular docking. But at present, uh, it, it does seem to be um, the one that uh, has worked. So as a follow-up question, what is the scoring that you are using? Sorry, this is me again uh, from Zoom. What is the scoring that we are using? Yeah. Yeah, I'm using uh, the oh. RMST. Right, 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 right. right. So this uh, confidence model, where does it come from? What does it do? Where did it go? Uh, or where does it go? Um, right, so this, this model is trained in a very straightforward fashion. We first train our diffusion model, or our score model. We generate a bunch of samples for um, uh, complexes in our training set. And we train another model to classify whether each pose is within two angstrom's RMSD of the ground truth binding pose. And so it's trained as a classifier on samples that have been generated by the score-based model, uh, sorry, by the diffusion model on training complexes. And you know, you may ask, well, does that generalize to, to, uh, uh, to test complexes where the distribution of the score model is you know, a little bit different? Well, that's a good question. In practice, we find that it does. Um, but um, that, that, yeah, so in a nutshell, that's how it's trained. Uh, there are certainly many nuances that we can, um, I'm glossing over and we can happily discuss offline. Okay, if there are no more questions on the method, I will hand over to Hannes to present the results. Yeah, so Bowen uh, already claimed that, um, well, right now, if we look at Tankbind and uh, we look at uh, DiffDog, then maybe DiffDog works a little bit better. But now let's uh, see how we come to that claim. And yeah, l let's look at the results. Oops, uh, wrong direction. But first, to, to look at the results, uh, what is the, the way that we train or the, the data that we train on and the data that we test on and what's the whole test setup, right? So the, the data that we use is from PDB binds, right? We, we have PDB with all of its 200,000 complexes and these guys went ahead and uh, filtered these complexes and uh, took the ones that have our proteins with small ligands bound to them and have binding affinities. And then we end up with these 19,000 experimentally determined structures. And we take the ones that are that were put into PDB from 2019 or older as the training data. And all the stuff that was put into PDB later, we use that as the test data. Right? So we have this sort of time split as the train test split. All right. And then the baselines that we compare against, um, because we already explained there, they include these traditional search-based methods and deep learning methods that are also quite, quite recent, including TankBind, for example. All right. But then uh, the first core set of results, again, here we're looking at the fraction of predictions that has an RMSD below two. So sort of the fraction of good predictions made by each model. And for the uh, for the deep learning based methods, we see that they can't really outperform the search based methods, like for example, Glide, which we'll maybe focus on a little bit because it's a very um, commercially used a lot and very popular. And if we now take a, a little bit of an improvement by combining something like Nina, which usually right is made for docking to a pocket, uh, with a method for finding the pocket first. So we have a two-step approach where we first find the pocket and then dock the ligand to that pocket. And then we yeah, we will get a little bit of a better performance in this blind docking scenario. And this is still not as much of an improvement as we're able to get with DiffDock, where we are 
yeah, able to put a pretty sizable margin in terms of percentage of good predictions to the to those baselines. But then I, I want to um, talk about the um, so may, maybe first of all what we saw so far were all predictions on holo structures where we take the the bound structure of the protein we just rip out the, the small molecule and then we we give the bound structure of the protein as input to DIFDOG and ask DIFDOG, yeah, where does the small molecule go? But now what we're doing here is no longer taking these bound structures of the protein and instead we take the structures folded up by a machine learning model like AlphaFold and in this case it's ESM fold. Yeah, and then we are able to see that uh, DIFDOC even puts a bigger, of course, the, the performance of DIFDOC compares compared to, uh, drops compared to uh, what it was able to achieve with the holo structures. But the relative difference to the baselines, um, if we're looking at this task, is even larger. And we, we think this is the case because uh, DIFDOC only reasons about the um, the, the alpha, so the score model of DIFDOC only looks at the alpha carbons and does not have an explicit representation of the side chains. It only it has to implicitly reason about the side chains, and then if you have the, your holo structure, um, if you would have your holo structure and its fixed side chains, which might move a lot during docking, right, uh, between the unbound and the bound structures, then this won't be a problem for DIFDOC as much as it would be for something like Nina, where if there's a side chain in the way that moves away during docking, then Nina can't do can't do anything about it unless you maybe run it with side chain flexibility. Anyway. Mm -hmm. How do you consider the RMSC of the backbone itself for the so, protein in this mm -hmm. kind of RMSD less than two extra complications? The, the, the backbone RMSD and the, so the RMSD of the um, of the protein is not included in any of these evaluations. We we align, we, we generate the structure with ESM fold, then we align its pocket to the ground truth pocket in the holo structure. And then we dock the small molecule to the um, to the ESM fold structure, and then we compare the small molecule only its RMSD, or we compute its RMSD to the ground truth small molecule. Yeah. Uh, two questions. One for the for the set that you have used for proteins with uh, different bounds. Uh, in terms of the quality of structure, do you have used this for? Say I, I'm only going to take X-ray structures with, like, say, one from the solution, uh, and so that's the first question. And the second is uh, in this subset that we eventually to to train and evaluate, uh, have you or do you know if there are cases where you have uh, a structure confirmation of one binding if it's binding? So therefore, this may be a whole different problem if you if you can have one, you know, you have mm -hmm. to change the structure. Yeah. So. The f first question, right, was: uh, Do we have filters like uh, only crystal structures with um, a resolution below two angstrom? And yes, there are filters like this in the process when the people or the PDB bind people filter out the um, their 19k complexes from a PDB, but. The two angstrom, for example, right now is not um, a concrete one in there. Like I'm, I don't know if they have a concrete number for the resolution. Do you re remember if they? Uh, so. But definitely, there are um, ones with like a three angstrom resolution. I, I've seen those. Uh, but yeah, the the second question, right, was um, what was the second question? And ah, okay, the how if we know how big basically the change is between the apo and the holo structures, and yeah, we to to get a guess at how big this change is, we can maybe look at the RMSD of the uh, protein uh, of the ESM fold structure after aligning it to the holo structure. And yeah, I do we do we have the plots? Yeah, in, in the yeah let's let's go to the, let's go to that. Da, da, da. 
Um, yeah. Where? Ah, yeah. Well, it's not exactly the uh, not exactly the, the plot that we meant, but what we have here on the on the x-axis, right, is here or here is the performance that we're able to get if the aligned or the ESM folded structure has an RMSD below 0.5 angstrom to the ground truth structure. And then here's the performance if the ESM fold structure is only this good. And here is the, the performance if the ESM fold structure is even worse. Yeah, so we, we have these cases where at least the ESM predicts that the APO structure would is quite different from the whole structure, but maybe ESM is just bad in in these cases. So we don't really have an uh, exact knowledge about how much conformational change there is during binding. Okay, but then let's get back to some of these results. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it looks really. really so I'm kind of curious, do you, do you think it's because of the C alpha? Like what I'm wondering if I understood what you were saying that it's because you essentially remove all the side chain information that it allows you to implicitly infer the side chain and how it acts the background the yeah. Is that the Yeah, so speculate why the method is better in this case. Yeah, the, this is one of the reasons like that we think that if we Mm, right, the, the model still has to reason about the side chains and it knows that uh, it is the side chain of a tyrosine that uh, should be pointing somewhere here. But uh, if we uh, if we were to explicitly model the side chains and we keep them rigid, right, then the you would have no way to uh, to uh, if the if the side chain is here. <laughs> You 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 would have no way to put your ligands in that position because you keep the side chain rigid and during the actual docking process maybe the side chain moves apart once the ligand come uh, gets there and, and docks to it and yeah. In the sense, the, the fact that you yeah, chemically implicit side chains allows you flexibility. Um, I I didn't get that point, but yeah. do you want to comment? Yeah, I think another thing to to say is you know if you are looking at the bound truth like uh, you know atomic structure bound atomic structure, then it becomes really like a you know like a key fitting puzzle, and so that's kind of you know, if you train with that, that's what your model is going to learn. While you know if you withhold the, for example the side chain information, the model really has to reason about you know. You know, also, you know, the, the sequence, and this is also kind of like you know, uh, sequence embeddings, and in general, kind of like more structure on, on a high level. Um, and just, just doing, you know, uh, key, key thing. Okay, thank you. Cool. Yeah. It would probably be something that would be scalable, but I'm curious if you've done any like follow up checks for experimental APO structures. And down structures versus ESM or other predictable ones. Nope. <laughs> we haven't checked any. Um, yeah. We, we ha and uh, no, I mean, uh, we can, we don't have to generate a training set to, uh, to get some interesting numbers, right? We can also look at. Uh, if we really have conformational change or we have some proteins where we know the exact conformational change that happens during binding and then look at the results there. And uh, we don't uh, have concrete results like that. Okay. But then let's also quickly look at the, the runtime here uh, because Stiftdoc is also through, like three times faster than the, the best baseline that we compared against here of course it is slower than these very fast regression based methods but this uh, we saw comes at the cost of some pretty unrealistic confirmations often and also worse RMSDs and worse fraction of RMSDs below two okay 
Then, um, also a quick note, right? Previously, this, this test set that we looked at had only this time split and we still had some receptors in the training data or we, we had receptors in the test data that were in the training data. The compounds always were different, but sometimes the receptor, receptors were the same. And now if we again look at the holo results, these are again this, this less realistic scenario maybe where we are um, yeah, looking at holo structures and not these M-fold structures. They are, uh, DIFDOC is still doing better than the baselines, but uh, not by as wide of a margin to say GLIDE, for example. But we also cannot ensure actually that GLIDE, um, that GLIDE is a commercial software, right? And probably they also update their models with the data that is out there. And we don't necessarily know exactly what data Glide was trained on. But still, um, these are the results in this maybe less conventional um, evaluation that the literature doesn't use as much. Yes. Okay. But then we, we already talked about this confidence score, right? And... Um, I want to tell you that this confidence score is actually also good in some sense. And that sense is selective accuracy, where we're looking here on, on the y-axis again at the quality, so the fraction of good predictions. And on the x-axis, we look at the fraction of predictions from which we are allowed to abstain from making a prediction. So let me explain that a little bit. Say we have a hundred complexes for which we... Um, or 100 complexes for which we make a prediction, but in the end, we only need to make a prediction for 40 of them. So let's make, a, let's only take the, the, these complexes for which we're the most confident in our prediction, right? That would then mean we abstain for 60% of, of the predictions for those we are allowed to abstain from making a prediction. And then we see that the performance that we get when only take uh, when taking the complexes for which the confidence model thinks that we're the best, then the fraction of RMSDs the below two that we get is around like seventy seven, I think, yeah, seventy eight percent. And what we do show in the green line here, that's with the green line here, that's what we would get if we were to always pick the best one based on knowledge about the ground truth. So we see with the confidence model, we're actually getting pretty close to that. And in terms of selective accuracy, the confidence model is, is rather rather good. All right. So then to finish, I want to bring home this point of uh, us generating rather physically plausible structures compared to these regression-based methods, which often have uh, produced intersections or self-intersections here um, or complete intersections here and yeah we believe that this is due to this uh, uncertainty or epistemic uncertainty uh, and or the way that a regression based method has to deal with uh, epistemic uncertainty where if you're unsure where to put your exact atom coordinate predictions between two different spots, then the best thing that you can do in expectation is to put your prediction at the middle so you end up with these very bunched up, uh, bunched up predictions. Okay, but then uh, you already saw um, the when we were skipping around, we have a bunch more slides if you're interested in some um, or if you have some questions, we might have some, some interesting answers to them. So please uh, let us know about those questions and yeah, let's have a nice discussion. So Nick, how do you usually do this? Do we just mingle or do we want to have a little Q&A? Yeah, and um, I think we have, we have definitely have time for questions. You've been peppered with questions throughout. There's another microphone down there that I can get. And what I could do if people have questions is I can walk around with the microphone and uh, mic you, mic you up, mic you out. Um, does that, you're good, does yeah. that work? Yeah, it works. Okay, good. Questions? Thank yeah. you, I, I think like the, uh, my uh, volume is fine. I see it. Oh, oh, it's good. Also for the, uh, for the Zoom people. So no, 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 no you need to use you it. speak into that. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So like, I, 
I'm not as familiar with the uh, the PD uh, bind database, but I had a similar problem with the machine learning when separating the testing and training data sets. Uh, like I, I remember that in your talk, you, the uh, the testing and training data sets were separated by a time step of 2019, right? Like before and after. I wonder if like in uh, structural biology, if there's a, a difference in how people do things, if there's like a uh, increase of accuracy or structures in the database, and if that's a additional variable to your uh, training method. Cause like when I was separating uh, data sets from time, uh, sorry, uh, by time versus like by completely random, the scores go a lot higher. Uh, I'm not sure if like, if you do the random separation of test and training, does the score go higher because you even out the uh, like bench top differences of scientists over the years. Yeah, so this is basically then what we, so there definitely are biases like this and it's a lot harder to test on this time split test set than if you were to just do a random split. And this is basically what we get um, or the random split is what we have in our validation set, right? Where we take all of the old structures and then we randomly create a validation set. And on this validation set, we're able to get much, much better numbers. Thank you. Hi, I have a question about, um, you showed that diff doc was like, uh, superior to a lot of the other models that you um, tested. And I was wondering if there's a specific subset that it excels in. Um, 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 and is it specifically something you brought up a lot was like proteins that have two binding sites. So is the predominant like pro outperformance those proteins? Yeah, I mean, um, where does it, I think what I would say where it, it excels is you know this uh, this apple kind of structure that Anis Anis was talking about. So I think if talk is definitely very good when you have kind of small you know or you know you don't know your bound structure, which is usually the case, and you know you have some kind of like very small maybe side chain flexibility. And so this is something that you know classical models really weren't really able to do. It's something that you couldn't do. And actually you know there are papers basically with with the title of you know how you cannot use something like alpha fold for docking and um and because you know these previous methods you know weren't able to actually use this uh, computational folder structures for for docking and so i think you know this kind of improvement is kind of what's i think most uh, promising or interesting for future i have two more questions um one is i noticed on your um timing of the results you use cpu have you played with gpu is there a reason no, why we, we use always gpus when it's available so uh like qvina and smina i think they're not oh, available sorry. On... this is the star is uh, yeah sorry my best uh, so I was trying whenever to read possible on gpu yeah, yeah okay uh so that's a quick one uh the next one can you speculate uh, applying these to protein protein uh, interactions. Yeah. Well, I could speculate, but I could or also maybe you can show the results. <laughs> results. So we have some three fantastic students at Technical University of Munich who were um, collaborating with us on yeah, de developing DiffDoc further or adapting it to the protein-protein docking task. So specifically the rigid protein-protein docking task, right? And what we do there is we use the, the DIPS data set uh, mostly, and we run this diffusion as Bowen explained it, just without the torsion angles. Now we diffuse over the uh, orientation and the translation of the ligand, which is now another protein. And then we, yeah, we look at the RMSDs that we are able to obtain with that. And here, maybe probably we want to look at, look at the, the, the complex RMSD over there on the left side. And we can see that, especially compared to the previous, um, so at the very, at the bottom, probably this doc PP40, this is what you want to look at, this doc PP40, not the, the Oracle one. The Oracle one would be if we have the perfect confidence model, so to say, um, but we don't. So this doc PP40 is what we want to look at. And uh, Equidoc was a previous deep learning method for, for tackling this task, which also had um, a, a better runtime than the, uh, than the 
than the classical search-based methods. Um, but yeah, over compared to Equidoc, we're doing much better in terms of accuracy. Here we have the previously with the small molecules, we were always always looking at RMSD below two, right? And now we're looking at below two, five, and ten because maybe for these proteins, um, predictions are also already good if we just have an RMSD um, below ten. And yeah, we can see that. Um, we were definitely able to do much better than the previous deep learning methods, also compared to some of these search-based methods. And well, there's maybe some weirdness going on with HDoc, where all of its predictions that are um, below two angstrom are also already below two angstrom, and actually they're also below 0.5 angstrom. So powerful does pretty well with some. Well, we also don't have any. Uh, well, we yeah we don't have results there, but we can comment in the sense of uh, there's we maybe struggle from a similar issue than than I thought that with there being little training data, but I think uh, that maybe. Yeah, this is one of the areas where we could improve up over something like AlphaFold Multimer for making these uh, predictions because uh, as far as we understand, AlphaFold Multimer is actually good, pretty good for these regular uh, dimer predictions. Do you have any? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I would just say to kind of maybe de-emphasize de is um, the fact that right now this is, you know, rigid uh, and you know, as if you are looking at something like ant antibodies, you definitely want to you know figure out good ways of adding at least some some local flexibility. Um, you know, that's I guess you know it's a whole different spectrum from you know uh, alpha fold multimer, which I guess kind of co-folds uh, the two things together. Yeah, maybe right. before you do the next question, we got some folks online. Well, can I continue the the comment on that? Like I'm, so this is a very low confidence statement but uh, i i think maybe um for the protein protein docking task or yeah for the protein protein docking task this rigid approach might not be uh, the best one and yeah we at least want to add some uh, backbone flexibility but then i'm not sure does it make sense to go this route or if we want backbone flexibility then is the aren't the better approaches just some of these regression based methods like alpha fold where we then um, just have complete or completely refold yeah but maybe some questions from online okay, folks folks online feel free to ask a question Otherwise, we could also maybe take more questions yeah, from here and wait until Shreya, someone raises you, his hand. Sorry, can you unmute? Yeah, I'm unmute. Yeah. So uh, my question was somewhat of the opposite of the question that was already asked. Where is there a particular class of proteins where uh, your ligand docking method does not work? I'm specifically thinking about something like a kinase, which has large loop motions in the backbone. And because you are only considering fixed backbone models, we are, you know, you said that you only have C alpha atoms in a fixed position. Uh, so for something like a kinase, where you would require a loop to move out for something for the ligand to bind, does your uh, model do well? Has anybody? I think he was saying to you. Um... Does does diff doc work well for kinases where there might be big loop motions in the protein? I don't know how to move on. Maybe it's on the wall. But I think that's what his question was. Yeah, I mean, obviously, something that you can do is, is try to dock to both comp, uh, to both confirmations. But you know, right now, uh, diffdoc does not uh, model confirmational uh, flexibility of the protein by itself. Implicitly, model you know the side chain, but doesn't model backbone flexibility. So, uh, you know, this is something that we're working on. But it's, I would say, you know, 
obviously you can dock on both structures, but otherwise, uh, no, this is not something that DiffDoc can, can do yet. Data on like uh, number of torsional bonds, and but I didn't do my bike pass. Like, does it do better if there are fewer? Yeah, I mean it's 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 not a great plot, unfortunately. But uh, um, I think basically the the bottom line of this plot is that the the obviously as it does, it's easier if there's it's smaller molecules as as you may expect, and as you you have also with other methods, but the performance difference, I think it's, it's relatively similar. There is no huge difference that we see. And can I just ask, like as a non-machine learning scientist, can you explain to me in a way I can understand why it might be that something with many more like torsional bonds, you could do just as good a job as something with very few torsional bonds? <laughs> No, I mean, I mean, I guess the 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 answer is we can't. Uh, I mean, if if something is very big, obviously you you're more likely to you know get something, uh, get it slightly worse. What I was saying is the difference with, I mean, but this is the same with previous methods, and so you know the difference. I think it's uh, it's kind of similar. Um, I have a question very much related to the question just asked, which is when you in the methods you mentioned. Um, when you're doing the twists, um, you do a post-torsion alignment. Um, and I was wondering if you could comment, is that just the catch? Like, how do you do that alignment? And if you're changing multiple torsion angles at once, um, yeah, can you comment on like, if you have more torsion angles, what does that alignment look like? And is that sometimes lead to, yeah, you're, you're preserving no angular momentum, but that does that lead to artifacts? Yeah, yeah. So um, the first part of your question is very easy to answer. It is a capture alignment. Uh, the second question, if I understand correctly, is, um, you know, like, what if I have multiple angles that I'm torsioning? Well, uh, the the procedure is, and and maybe uh, uh, hopefully it's not too hard to convince yourself of this, is that if you twist one torsion angle, do RMSD alignment, twist another torsion angle, do RMSD alignment. That's actually the same as twisting both torsion angles and then aligning after the fact, because. You know, you, one way of thinking about this is when you twist a torsion angle, you know, forget for a moment the exact orientation of the of the of the ligand. Um, given the torsion angles, you have a unique confirmation of the ligand defined up to some global rotor translation, right? So if by applying one torsion and then another torsion or both torsions at once, I arrive at the same confirmation of the ligand, then there is a unique rotor translation that maps that to the original ligand. So in that sense, um, you can apply. You know these torsions in whatever you order you would like. Um, you can alternate the applications of the torsion with the RMSDs. Um, all of these things commute with each other um, as long as you don't do like rotations and translations in between. All right, so you do all of the torsions and then RMSD align because in practice that's the most efficient, right? You that way you only have to do RMSD once, and then you uh, rotate and translate. Does he have a question? Starting with n random doses, how sensitive is the results of those n? Yeah, we have a slide for that. Yeah, so um, as you can, so um, in the main results that we report, we use forty samples. Um, but you know that's not a hard rule. It, it was just happened to be a number at which the performance tended to saturate. Um, but as you can see, you already get pretty decent performance with 10 samples. So if, for example, you're concerned about runtime, this is a super easy way to just cut your runtime by a factor of four. And uh, the curves here are, um, yeah, uh, uh, m maybe they're self-explanatory, but let me also just briefly comment on them. Uh, the gray line is the best sampled pose. How good is that pose? Right? And then the blue line is the best ranked pose. How good is that pose? Right, and so there is a little bit of a, 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 a gap, right? But, um, uh, and, and where the blue line intersects the 40, that's the 38% that we always report, right? Because the main result that we report is we generate 40 samples and we take the best ranked pose. How good is that pose? And 38% uh, of those are under two RMSD. If you had some Oracle that could tell you what the best pose is, you would uh, get, get better numbers. And the top five and top 10 are of the top uh, five ranked pose. How good is the best one? And top 10 is of the top 10 ranked poses, how good is the best one? And you know maybe this, uh, this slicing and dicing can get a little bit confusing. So I would say, look at the blue line and the gray line. Uh, those, are the, those are the relevant ones. 
Does that answer your question? Yeah, and is it, is it sort of like beneficial to have them well spaced out in the space, or is it like if you happen to have yeah. a random code that is right in the first yeah, I see. I see. Um, I think there's certainly a lot of room for development of uh, adaptive sampling procedures that you know could guide the diffusion or maybe cluster uh, as you go. And so you try to cover as many of the relevant modes as possible. Um, we currently haven't implemented any of those. So all of the samples and all of the results that you see here are just completely independent. Um, the kind of procedure that you describe, I think, would actually be uh, potentially beneficial, um, but it's not something that we've explored. Oh, can I go for it? Oh, oh, yeah, over there. Oh, yeah. Okay. I guess two points. I don't know exactly for whom they, they should go, but <laughs> one of it, it's for me, it's um, it's not super clear how you are representing the protein in this particular setting. So I guess you know you talk about something. Oh well, but it knows where the side chains are. But so so what is exactly the data structure? Yeah. Of the protein that is going in. Yeah, yeah. So what the model sees is it sees a point cloud consisting of the alpha carbon positions of the proteins and the all atom positions of the ligand at that current point in time. And the model also sees the chemical bonds of the ligand. And uh, you know, it has like a nearest neighbor or, or radius graph among the alpha carbons. So in a nutshell, it has a graph embedded in 3D space. And this neural network is just a normal, well, not completely normal, but it's a, it fits within the framework of a message passing network on graphs. And in this case, it's a 3D aware message passing neural network because all of the nodes in our graph uh, are positions in 3D space. What kind of features do you have in the nodes of your graph? Oh, I see. Um, so the, 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 the ligand atoms have uh, quite a few features, just the like general chemical features, like are they in an ar aromatic ring? Um, is it a double bond? Is it a single bond? Uh, what kind of an atom is it? That sort of thing. The protein uh, atoms, um, the, the main information going in there is uh, embeddings from ESM. So we take the protein sequence and we run ESM on them and we get ESM uh, embeddings out, uh, 1024 dimensional embeddings or uh, you know, so whatever the case you, may be. You, you see that that's, that's actually a lot of information, right? That's actually a lot of vectors, yes. a, lot of, a lot of values that a machine learning model can actually fit in. Yeah, so we do have some results uh, with a model that is trained without the ESM embeddings. Do we have them in the... I think it's pretty far then. Yeah, so what we find is that for a small score model, the ESM embeddings help a lot. But for a large score model, which is the final model that we show results for, uh, the ESM embeddings don't actually uh, cause that big of a change. Um, is that what this no, is? Or, no, oh, no. right. So yeah, so, so the 38% is with the kind of like the, the, the large model that we trained, you know, right before the, 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 the paper deadline. And we didn't have time to train. <laughs> we didn't have time to train an equivalently sized model without ESM embeddings. What we have trained is, you know, when we were doing the iteration, we found that for a smaller model, the ESM embeddings helped a lot. Once we scaled to the bigger model and then took away the ESM embeddings, the performance by this metric dropped 4%. Well, that's pretty impressive. Uh, uh, we did so. This four percent is on the big model, so it's thirty-four on uh, without ESM embedding. Yeah, yeah. And, and we did it because one of the reviewers asked. For it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, very, very sensible. But you know, I mean, as I'm sure we all understand, under because I guess time constraints, you, you do certain things. So you know, I was sure, of course. But I guess if you just do something like a one-hot encoding in a, in each one of those nodes, that's that's yeah. a thirty-four. 34. Okay, so let me now tell you, well, not, not, not let me tell you, but let me ask you about a few <laughs> other things. So, so you know this thing in structural biology about data splits, right? So in when you did your data splits, uh, what was the sequence identity of your testing and training set? So, so this is our, you want to? I mean, this, these are the two uh, set of uh, predictions that Anes uh, explained. So this uh, one is uh, just time split. So anything before 2019 and anything after 2019. Um, and this one is the, the one on uh, unseen receptors. So this is basically taking receptors. Uh, I mean, this is, uh, is uh, we... We, yeah, we cluster by Uniprot ID. So I don't know exactly, I don't think there is a number of similarity, but you know, I think you can have, you know, uh, 
right? You know, you can have quite a few differences and you know still have the same Uniper ID. So these are basically you know different different proteins. Uh, actually, they tend to be quite larger than I guess just because of uh, bias. You know, these days we 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 crystallize bigger proteins, so that's that's kind of why. For example, you see that you know the the previous you know uh, deep learning methods uh, actually completely drop to like less than 5% uh, because there is quite a bit of difference in, in this results. But I think what is interesting to see is that also, for instance, Glide, which is a non-deep learning method, does not drop as much as others. Sorry, I wouldn't consider Glide because Glide has been trained on this data. Okay, QVina. So QVina, you know, drops from, you know, about uh, maybe 20 to 14%. To 15, right. Uh, but, you know, Yes, it definitely, you know, physics-based methods do better, you know, do generalize better. And But I have to tell you, I, I do not understand exactly what the data split you've done, because I think here there's only really one way to make a data split, which is based on sequence identity. I don't, I don't absolutely understand, sort of like, oh, we clustered through Uniprot codes or whatever. I don't really no. know what we that just, means. We just take the uh, if tool, no. If we have proteins in our test set that have a Uniprot ID that is in our training set, then we don't include it. So all of the proteins in our test set have a different Uniprot ID than all the proteins in our training set. And that's, that's it. Right. And if you have a very high sequence similarity, then you will also have the same Uniprot ID. So we know well, that. Well, we... well. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> well, then. I know it varies, it varies, you know, depending on the family. I think, you know, there are things that are quite a lot different, and we were kind of evaluating. We just use this uh, difference, this split for, for generalization, because that's what people in the field have been using. Well, depends who you consider inside of the field. Right? Yeah, so yeah. I maybe don't agree so much with the statement of people in the field. Like, people in the field haven't been using this test that even since, like, Equibind was the first paper who started doing this. So maybe... Honestly, just like super simplistic, I guess there's two clean ways to do it, right? Where you put a sequence threshold, and so, like, very, you said, how much do your, your model perform if there's 50% of sequences related between test and training, or less, 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 and then you see, so like other thing drops more than that. Or you could also do it just based on uh, structural similarity, right? So, so like yeah. generally, processors that are very far away, just based on structure, are also very different in terms of um, I mean, you know, I, I think that's that's a, a completely fair point, and you know that you know uh, you know one one can do can do a lot of splits. I do want to point out that there is actually some papers in the field that have you know argued for against this kind of splits uh, because I mean I guess the question is always you know what what are you going to use your your things for? And you know like typically, for example, you know in most maybe pharmaceutical settings, you're actually most of your uh, things that you have that you're using against are actually things that have something in PDB. So you know, I, I think you know, obviously, you know, you you work a lot on discovery on very f different things, and so I mean, I think you know, at, at the end of the day, everybody can develop their own splits. But you know, I think we were kind of just putting this as a, as a way of highlighting, you know, definitely there is there is a difference if you are you know something and. We we ha we have a question in the back of the room here. That sounds like a great over a beer kind of follow up there. Okay, question in the back of the room. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so motivated by a couple of other questions just asked before. So you mentioned that your score and confidence is weakly correlated with the um, binding energies. So is there any way to compare uh, how different molecules are able to dock to the protein and um, and and I was, and also uh, from from another question earlier, uh, uh, how the accuracy kind of decreases as you increase the amount of torsion angles. So, um, is there any way to perform like a pairwise comparison of molecules if you were to add a, for example, linker between the molecules uh, to see which one binds better to a particular pockets? So, I'll take the first one because it's uh, so they. First question is on binding affinity, 
And you know, it's it's it's, it's a challenging question. And uh, you know, we we have seen that you know just running. Uh, we haven't actually tested exactly the, the confidence model, but we have tested, you know, just building something on top of the prediction. And you can easily get performance of, you know, what people in the field call, you know, the state of the art, which is, you know, these this things are, you know, like more than, the, you know, one log unit away. And so you can easily get this, but, you know, to actually get beyond, I think it's, it's a very challenging question. And it's something that we are kind of looking into. Uh, I don't think we have a, a silver bullet yet, uh, a, a really good way of actually uh, getting to uh, to something a, a lot better. And uh, just a sec, the other question that you asked, could you just repeat it that I, I didn't quite... So, so, so you're doing a single molecule at a time, right? Um, is it possible to do multiple molecules and see which one um, have, like... Which one basically com out competes the weaker binding molecule, and and since you mentioned that um, uh, uh, it doesn't self intersect, so I'm wondering if it if, if it can be achieved by just adding a linker between two molecules. So I I don't I think I mean I I think the answer is no. How to compete? I think it gets back to the binding affinity. So I think the answer is no, and you know. I think the best way of using DiffDoc as it currently is, or you know, to understand wh what it is, is just to look at the confidence, which you know is going to be correlated with which one uh, the model thinks bind best. But uh, you know, I, I wouldn't take it as a you know, confidence prediction. Yeah, if I could just add a uh, addendum to that. So I think what you propose is uh, quite interesting, and certainly that's something that you could run and. In the limit of like extremely obvious cases of what should bind and what shouldn't bind, um, it's you know not so difficult to imagine that diffdoc would be like you, for example, if you have something that does truly very strongly bind to this particular binding pocket, and you attach something that just completely has no binding activity at all, then you know, I would imagine it's quite likely that the 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 cor um, the correct chemical um, group corresponding to the one that binds is going to make its way in the binding pocket. But if you're trying to use this as a way to tell, you know, fine differences between two things that you know roughly bind with the same activity, this is not something that we've tested. And, and so um, I don't know what the results would be in that case. But with an extreme enough contrast, you can imagine something like that working. Okay. So, okay. I have a sorry. maybe um, oh sorry. Sure. Uh, maybe a one suggestion and a question. Uh, I guess the suggestion would be to I mean, address Bruno and people like Bruno here. Uh, if you make a plot of similarity to uh, training set versus the uh, performance and just see what that curve looks like, I think that could probably address all those concerns. Um, and that will show you like, hey, if it's too close to training set, how close is it? And see if that what that curve looks like. Yeah. Um, and, and for a question, just more of a general question. Uh, so it shows that you could get up to about 40%. I guess one general question is like, how about the rest of the sixty percent? What's the what's preventing you from doing this? Is it like methodological data, or could you could you speculate about what's missing to get to one hundred percent? Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I will add some speculation. I'm sure these guys have more speculations. But um, to me, I think the main thing is that if you look at something like protein structure prediction, um, a lot of the signal there is coming from the multiple sequence alignment. Uh, I, I know that, Sergey, you had a, a very nice paper uh, uh, showing what exactly this multiple sequence alignment is doing. And I, I guess if we try to apply it to our context, we can maybe say that, uh, um, you know, maybe maybe our model has... Okay, well, uh, oh yeah, it's uh, way back. Anyways, not, to, to, to not belabor the point, um, the lack of something equivalent to a multiple sequence alignment in the case of protein ligand docking uh, we think is the major factor that sets it apart from a problem like protein-protein docking or protein um, uh, just single structure prediction, right? And uh, this is a property that places it in the same category as something like antibody-antigen docking, where you know either one of the pairs is not a protein at all, or and the other pair is so rapidly evolving that multiple sequence alignments are of limited utility. So we see the common. Co uh, so, so personally, I see that the, the common thread between these very difficult problems is the the absence of this. Uh, um, a co-evolutionary like signal. Um, I, I don't know what the right way of getting around that is, um, but that's my personal speculation on the reason. 
That's the, great. Maybe we have time for one or two more no, questions. Uh, before oh, that, to, to this question, I think it's very relevant to add that it's not a 60% gap. We actually don't know how big the gap is, right? Because we might have um, things like this in our test data as well, where we predict the right position uh, here. Maybe one of the, the, the red one is the prediction that we finally take as the, the prediction. But in our test set, we... Uh, take this one as the ground truth one and not the other one and so we don't have this um, hundred percent or this this hundred percent RMSD below two is not actually achievable but I don't think we have that many of these cases so hmm. yeah you're far away yeah, yeah. Um, coming back to the sort of the earlier obsession with like which subsets it might be doing well or which ones are at forty percent versus sixty or whatever the percentage is. Uh, did you ever look at like how it performs on fragments? So like really small, but and usually low affinity, but they do kind of bind specifically, and they're very useful for medicinal chemists. I, I guess the answer is no. Uh, I mean, uh, I would point back to the same plot that we've shown before. My intuition is that uh, it could actually be something very effective to do on fragments, especially if you may be trained uh, more on this kind of fragments, you know, retrain the model on this kind of fragments, because maybe, you know, the signal is, is lower, you know, the physical signal is lower. And so that's kind of why the traditional docking methods, uh, you know, have, have, have issues. But, uh, you know, here you have more, more signal from, you know, just, you know, for example, when you're doing like a fragment, you typically are, you know, interested in a fragment that can then build up from which you can then build up a, a molecule. And so, if you train actually with this with this kind of bias in your data set, you know, the model is going to try to find, you know, physical interaction. But physical interaction is in places where you can then, you know, build up a, a molecule from it. And so, I think this bias could actually help you uh, develop comparatively, you know, like a physics-based methods. But this is not something that that we've done. Crystallography, and you were talking about NSAs and the lack thereof, and small molecules. But there's a lot more hydrogen crystallography going on with, like, you know, one target protein and a series of compounds. Like, I wonder if you thought about, like, is there like can you leverage that some somehow in a way that might kind of make up for NSAs not having NSAs? I don't know if that's even a, a sensible. Question. Yeah, I, I I think that's probably uh, quite sensible, but uh, unfortunately, um, I, this is not like a. Uh, we're not very familiar with this kind of data, so we haven't done the digging and the thinking to see how we might leverage that kind of data. Um, but the point, uh, or, or something similar to the point you're making, has been brought up a couple of times before using these kind of fragment-based screens and uh, seeing if that can improve these, uh, uh, you know, get, get the performance gap to be, you know, get a little bit closer to the maximum attainable performance. And uh, yeah, I, I think that's probably a very sensible direction to look into. But again, that's not something that we've personally worked on. Great. One la any last questions? Good time. One for one more. These guys have been working hard up here. Okay. Sorry, can you say that last phrase again? Yeah, and, and this, is, this is a very interesting question and, you know, actually something that we are we are thinking about, you know, um, maybe to kind of repeat the question is, you know, like, let's say that you're interested, in, you're doing a screen on a particular protein, you know, can you fine tune the model that right now is trained to find, and, you know, against any possible protein, can you fine tune on your protein of interest? And I think the, the interesting question is, you know, what kind of, uh, you can definitely, you know, fine tune the model as it is if you have, you know, a lot of crystal data. But even, even in a pharma setting, you probably, you know, don't have a lot of crystal data. But then, you know, how can you use it? And, you know, maybe using different kinds of, of signal. And, you know, that is something that we are, we are looking into. So great talk, by the way. And thank you for it. It was very interesting. But my question is more about the performance tuning. So you, you'd mentioned, the, you know, the runtime. Is the slow step like GPU clock, GPU RAM, memory bus, storage? 
like if you were going to scale this up to a couple billion compounds, what would you put in your system? So a couple of billion is challenging. <laughs> um, pick, pick, your, pick an arbitrary scale for what the slope. Yeah, so I, I, I do think I do think that one, even just you know, with, with better engineering, can probably scale up, the, and maybe you know, reducing some of the hyperparameters can probably uh, improve the the runtime by you know, ten, uh, maybe fifty x. The I think going beyond that is going to be challenging. And so I do think that, you know, probably, I'm not sure if you're ever going to get with this kind of model to, you know, a billion molecule screen. Uh, but. Uh, yeah. So the, hard, the hardware bottleneck is the number of GPUs. We can just parallelize across more GPUs. All right. Uh, let's thank Gabriele, Hannes, and Bowen one more time. Thank you. And from our side, definitely a huge thanks to this amazing audience. Like, there, it seldomly happens that there are so many questions and so many good discussions going on. All right, y'all. Well, thanks, you guys, for joining us. Um, there's still a lot of pizza here and drinks, so please feel free to hang around and talk to each other. Uh, one quick thing I want to say. Uh, so next month, we'll have uh, Hannah uh, Wayman Steele coming to visit us. Uh, she'll give a talk on understanding and discovering fold switching proteins by combining alpha fold two and sequence clustering. Uh, so that's gonna be on the Cambridge side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And feel free to hang out. We're all here to answer questions and whatnot. Thank you. <laughs>